you've probably heard about the occultic marketing and the new age marketing that is directed at kids. And you can see this on the screen. Here's SpongeBob with a Ouija board and a circle of protection. And you can see these Barbies that are involved with witchcraft. I mean, way beyond the yoga, which is also concerning that Barbie's involved in. Kids are being targeted. And so we're going to talk about this today with our good friend and our sister in Christ, Marcia Montenegro of Christian Answers for the New Age. Link to her incredible website in the description below. And Marcia's book, Spellbound, has been updated, added to, and is being re-released as we speak. And we're so excited. The book is called Spellbound, The Paranormal Seduction of Today's Kids. Marcia, thank you for joining me to talk about this. Hi, thanks so much for having me, Doreen, uh, to discuss this topic, which is still very current, even though the first edition of this book came out in 2006. It is, if anything, even more yeah. current. So, yeah, it's just, it's blatant, isn't it? I mean, the amount yeah. of occultism that's inserted into kids programming, and it doesn't just affect kids. So if you're not a parent, don't turn off this video because this is affecting all right. kinds, of, all ages. And, right. and maybe you're an aunt of someone you care about, or right. you've got, you've got um, you know, your child care, or you're a teacher. So we need to be up to speed on what's going on with kids. And, and it's interesting, you started the book with your own deception in paranormal as a child with a dream, and how you didn't have some sort of Christian covering to help you to understand that what happened to you biblically. That's right. I did not. Um, I had a dream that uh, gave me information about a, a, a childhood playmate who I hadn't seen in years. I was 11 and I had a dream uh, where I was looking for this little boy I used to know years earlier when I was the last time I had seen him, I had been five years old. But he had been a playmate. He lived um, nearby. We were the same age, and we just we just played together a lot. His name was Gary. And of course, I we had moved away and lived overseas in two different places since I had seen him. And so I hadn't really thought about him. Of course, I mean, you know, when you're a child. You know, you just move on with your life. You don't you don't linger and think about old memories from the past right so um you know I don't think I ever thought about him but I had a dream where I was in a house and I was looking for him and I had this very frantic urge to find him and I was going in every room and I was calling out his name and I got to this room with a closet and I opened the closet door and there were all these children like sitting in the closet kind of like they were hiding and I opened the door and I said, Gary, Gary, are you here? And these children were all kind of kind of laughing, you know, because it was kind of like a game, like we were playing a game. And they all kind of came out of the room. And I was looking like, you know, Gary's got to be here. And he wasn't there. And I woke up from the dream. And I, I didn't know what to make of it. You know, I thought it was kind of an odd dream that I would dream about him. And I felt sort of like uh, it, it had been cut short because I didn't find him. So I felt like, oh, you know, why couldn't I find him? But then, you know, I didn't really think about it. <clears throat> and then a couple of months later, now my memory, of course, on the exact time uh, that this happened is pretty vague. But I do remember exactly what happened. And I'm thinking it was about two to three months later. I was in the car with my mother. And she said, uh, she was driving and she said, oh, do you remember little Gary? And she said his last name. And uh, she said, you know, you used to play with him. And I said, oh, I said, yeah, I, I remember him. And one reason I remembered him is my father was a camera buff and he took videos of everything. Now, this is in the days before you can do videos with your phone. <laughs> so yes. he did it. He did it the old fashioned way. And he just took he took pictures of birthday parties, of me playing, of, you know, every, just everything. He was just he was just really uh, crazy about doing that kind of thing. So I had seen lots of videos 
childhood videos of me with Gary, like sledding down a hill when it snowed and it and him and my birthday party and things like that. So I think that's one reason I remember him so well. And I said, yeah, I remember him. And my mother said, well, I have some sad news. Um, she said, um, she named another family that was a mutual friends. And she said, um, so-and-so told me that Gary died of leukemia. And I said, oh, oh, when, oh, when did he die? And she said, well, I'm not sure, a couple of months ago. Wow. And after she said that, I remembered the dream. Um, I don't know if the dream came to me before she said that when she told me his name. I'm not sure, but I definitely was thinking of the dream after that. And I thought, oh, that's why I couldn't find him in the dream. So to me, I didn't know the words. Um, I wasn't familiar with the concept of supernatural or paranormal. But I knew this was not a normal kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I thought somehow I was given this information about him in this dream. Um, and that kind of just stayed in my mind. And I believe that that was a seed that was planted that eventually got me to start investigating the supernatural, which by the time I was 15 and 16, I, I was beginning to look into things that were, were paranormal, things like um, what we would call psychic powers, powers of the mind, knowing um, something that's going to happen or knowing what someone's thinking, that all that kind of thing. So by the time I was 16, I was very, very interested in that stuff. And I feel like that was a seed that was kind of planted. I did not, as I recall, I did not tell my mother about the dream. And I don't think I ever told anybody about it. Um, I guess because I wasn't sure what my mother's reaction would be or if she would maybe dismiss it and say, oh, you know, that was just a dream. Because to me, it felt very special. So um, I didn't say anything. But I always remembered at that, and that kind of stayed with me. Now, mm -hmm. now looking back on it as a Christian, I think that uh, there's two possibilities. One is that he had already died when I had the dream. Therefore, it wasn't a dream foretelling anything that would happen. It was all, it was already a, a, you know an event that happened. The other was that he I had the dream when he had the leukemia and was already in the final stages. Um, it used to be, things are different now, but it used to be they they couldn't treat leukemia very well in children. It was um, really a bad, bad illness to have, and a lot of children died from it a lot more then than they do now because now they have more advanced treatments. Um, and it could be he was like maybe in the end stages of it already, and his death was kind of certain. I don't know that then maybe that's when I had the dream. Who knows? Either way, I had been given information that I couldn't possibly know. Um, and that was what intrigued me. Mm. Yeah, I understand. So a lot of what we're talking about with your new book, Spellbound, Marsha, is that the allure of the occult the allure of secret hidden knowledge and the new age it it often starts in childhood with these paranormal experiences that kids have and for some reason you felt like you couldn't talk to your mom mm -mm. and and so if you're if you grow up in a, a biblically based family that has open discussions you know what did you dream about last night or what did you do in school today if they're not homeschooled uh, it'd be more likely that there'd be some interaction. But like you, I had a dream that was very life-changing in childhood. And I also wow. kept it from my parents. And, wow. and, and mine was about an alien abduction. And the same thing, I thought my parents would just say that it was because I had food poisoning or something. So yeah. <laughs> I didn't talk about it. Um, but it was pivotal in my life, like yours. So let's talk about to the parents who are watching this. How can we encourage our kids to discuss these very private, like you said, special experiences so that they don't become cloistered in darkness. Yes. And I think, I think we should, we should talk to children about these things, especially because they're being exposed to this kind of stuff in the culture. 
So it's in the culture, uh, whether it's on TV shows, in movies, in books, or from their friends. Um, it's it's there. It's there's so much of it out there. Uh, so I think that it would be good for for parents to talk to their child about things that seem, um, you know, the supernatural. How do we deal with the idea of something that's supernatural? And explain to them what it is. And in my book, um, I do that. I divide it up into, uh, and I think this is kind of normal that the cult is divided up into these three areas, um, divination, spirit contact, and sorcery. And I define each one. And I use Deuteronomy 18, verses 10 and 11, which lists all the practices of the occult or their, cate- their categories. It doesn't list every single thing, you know, but it lists all the categories that the occult falls under. And um, I explain the terms and talk about examples in the book and the rest of the book. And I also talk about how you can bring this up with your child and talk to your child. Because um, I think a lot of parents think, well, I don't want to talk about this because it might make them interested. And the problem is, is they're already being exposed to it and they may be already wondering about it, but they're probably not going to ask you about it. So it's good to sit down with them and say, let's talk about this, especially if they've seen a movie or read a book where there's a supernatural kind of thing going on, a ghost or, um, you know, this time of year near Halloween, there's all these ghost stories and spooky things. It's a good time to sit down with them and say, let's talk about this. Let's you know, do you really think that there's such a thing as a ghost? You know, what do you think a ghost is? And let's let's see what God has to say about that. So I'm all for talking to parents, talking to, and I've talked to a lot of youth groups over the years about the occult. And um, they have already, when I talk to youth groups, if they're teenagers, they already have come across this stuff. You know, some of them were actually doing it, you know, had tarot cards or something. So it's not like some kind of secret thing that they're never going to find out about, you know. And since God's word addresses it, I think that that we can address it because God addresses it. Um, so I do think that it's, of course, that you have to do it in the age appropriate way. And you don't want to scare younger children. So I think the best way to do that is using God's word because of what God says. But I also suggest in my book to talk to them about who God is first. Who is God? God is the creator of everything. God has power over everything. So there's nothing that that is going to be something God can't deal with. God can deal with anything. He can keep anything evil away if, if he desires to do so. So I think it's good to talk to them about the character of God and who he is so that they know they can trust God with these kind of things. And that's really important because even though you're their parent and they love you and you do whatever you can to protect them, you don't have the kind of power and authority that God has. So it's good for them to know they can go to God first of all. Um and then to to talk about these things, I, I think it's maybe uh, it depends, I think, on the situation and the child. But certainly when they come up, if you just want to sit down and talk about it in general, you know, maybe because you're aware of all of it in the culture, you can just have a talk with them and say, let's talk about this stuff we're seeing out in the culture and then use God's word. Go to Deuteronomy 18. And. My approach would be to explain that these practices, and we can see from the context of the passage, the practices are associated with the worship of false gods. So this was a way that people who had turned away, these are people who had turned away from God and were seeking out false gods and, you know, fashioning gods for themselves, as it tells us in Romans 1, from creation. And they believed all in all of these different gods and the way to communicate and get information from these gods was divination and sorcery and spirit contact. That was, that was how they, they dealt with getting information from their gods. And that's one reason God finds these practices, uh, you know, so um, repulsive. Uh, And so I think that, 
if you take that approach using God's word and talking about God's character, that's the best way to approach it. And then I think also with, with younger children, um, another, another way that I've done it, actually, I did this with some very young children one time. I talked about Adam and Eve in the garden. And I talked about, you know, they knew, they knew the basic story. Uh, but I went over it, you know, and, and we talked about, okay, so God told them not to eat from this one tree, you know, but what happened? You know, oh, well, Eve, you know, took a bite of the fruit and then gave it to Adam. Okay, was that wrong? Yes, yes, because God said it was wrong. But now they have they have disobeyed God. It's broken their relationship with God. And I said, but who decided what was right and wrong before they decided to do this? Well, God, God did. So I talked about how God is the one who decides what is right and wrong. Mm. And we can't decide on our own. We have to go by what God says. And when God says something is wrong, it's because it's it's against him and because it's harmful. So even though it might look fun, it might be interesting you might even enjoy it. <laughs> it is ultimately going to be harmful for you because God has said, do not do this. So I, I actually approached it that way. Um, the whole point of that particular uh, thing about talking about Adam and Eve was to talk to them about the yin and yang symbol because some parents had asked me to talk to them about that particular symbol. symbol. And it was children. It was like children from three different families. And we were in a home and they ranged from like age five to nine or 10, I think. So I did it with the Adam and Eve story. I was thinking especially of, you know, the youngest, the youngest child who was about five. And then I said, now look at this yin and yang symbol. This symbol is about the fact that good and evil have to be the same. They have to be in, in balance. And I explained what that meant <laughs> to the younger child. And that they actually need each other. But I said, but God shows us with the story of Adam and Eve that God is all good. There's no bad in God. And God's the one who decides what's good and evil. And that is not what this yin yang symbol is saying. It's saying something completely different. So that was how I approached it. So I think if you, you know, if you just think about, you know, you can maybe use other uh, stories from the Bible as well to show things. And if you do that, it really, not only are you using God's word, but it really impresses on the child. You know, it, it helps them remember things when they hear a story attached to it. So I think that's one way to approach talking about the occult to children. And um, I know I get a lot of messages from um, and emails from grandparents oh. who are concerned about their grandchildren who are going to a certain movie mm -hmm. that celebrates the occult. Right. And and. And they want to know, um, you know, what can they say either to the parent <laughs> or maybe what can they say to the grandchild um, about this? How can they talk to the, the grandchild about it? So it can be, you know, grandchildren. You could be a Sunday school teacher. You might get questions about this as a Sunday school teacher, a youth leader, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, you don't have to be a parent to be talking to a younger person on this topic. I love, Marcia, how your book Spellbound, and you're talking right now about teaching children discernment, which is something that's so important in comparing it to scripture. I love how you use Adam and Eve as a comparison, because that's really where it all began. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so when you walk in the toy section of Target or Walmart, or you listen to the popular music such as Taylor Swift, who promotes occultism and witchcraft openly. And the younger and younger kids are calling themselves Swifties. So the influence yeah. of the devil is so in the ingrained in everyday life. So as, as a parent, I mean, do you shield your child from that? Do you say, absolutely not, you can't listen to Taylor Swift? Or do you just say, we're not going in the toy section of, of Target ever? How do you, how do you, do, you yeah. do you, the question is, do you shield your kids from this or do you just take them through and use it as an object lesson in discernment? Yeah. And that, yes, and that is, um, yeah, that's the $64,000 question. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's like, that's a big question. Um, 
Yeah, I I don't think you can keep your children away from the stuff because it's in the culture. They're going to encounter it. Now, I do think in terms of age, uh, younger ages, you can uh, forbid certain programs or certain books. You can just say, no, I'm sorry, I cannot let you read that book or I'm not going to let you watch that movie. Um, you know, up to a certain age, I would say at least up to age 10 or 11, I think. I think that, and I, and I do have an adult son, so I did did raise a child. I think that you can draw certain lines there and say no, um, and and you can even ex, you can even say if they say why, you can say because there are things in this program that God does not like and has said He does not want us to to participate in. Or, you know, we can't think that it's good, but this program makes it look good. And that's that's a very simple, simple way to explain to a younger child that I think they would understand. Um, Another thing to do is as your parent, you can say as your parent, I am responsible for your spiritual upbringing and the decisions that I make about this. I'm going to have to answer to God for this. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm taking it very seriously. And even if you disagree with me, I'm the one that's going to have to answer to God. I actually used that on my son one time <laughs> um, who wanted to do, I think it was some kind of video game. Um, and I think he was about, I'm trying to remember how old he was. I think he was about 12, maybe. So he was a little older, maybe even 13. And he was, he's a, he's very smart and he's, he can argue like a lawyer. <laughs> oh boy which I think a lot of teenagers can do. Yeah. <laughs> and he was just giving me all the, the back and forth on it. Why, you know, he should do it. He should participate in this game, et cetera, et cetera. And finally I said, it kind of came to me, you know what? I'm going to have to answer to God for my decision on this. And so I'm not comfortable saying anything, but no. Yeah. And yeah. you know what? He, that was it. He accepted that right away. He was he like, knew. okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, yeah, it was like he didn't have an answer for that. He didn't have a way to, you know, like the other things I was saying, <laughs> he didn't have a way to he didn't have a comeback to it. So yeah. I don't know. That's one point you can always make as well. Now, for older, you know, slightly older children, I think once they're 12, 13 and, you know, 14, 15, uh, you can, depending on what it is, if OK, if they've already seen it like a certain movie. Then I I would talk I would see the movie as an adult and then I would talk to them about it and I'd say let's let's talk about this let's mm-hmm. go over this I want to hear your thoughts on it and let's see if there's anything that God has to say about this particular um, activity in the movie you know okay mm-hmm. so there was somebody casting spells and it was the hero was casting spells and was doing good things by casting spells okay. So let's think about that. So you find the passage where it says Deuteronomy 18, you know, no, do not cast spells. And there's other passages as well. It's not just Deuteronomy 18. I want to point out there's lots of other passages. Um, and then see God condemns it. Well, why? Well, see, it's associated with this worship of false gods. Um, God says not to do it. This is evil. This power in the spell is not coming from God. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you don't want to have anything to do with it, even though the hero is using it and it looks good. The hero is doing something good with it. It can't be good if the power is not coming from God. Right. It just looks good, mm-hmm. but it's not good. And then you can also talk about how Satan disguises himself as an angel of light in Second Corinthians 11 and how that Satan is, you know, and I think we can talk about Satan with children without scaring them. First of all, we can tell them that, of course, Jesus conquered Satan on the cross. So it's Satan doesn't have some kind of power that he's going to be able to do something that God doesn't let him do. Well, that's always been true. But especially now that um, he's been, uh, you know, conquered on the cross by Jesus. If you are a believer in Christ, uh, you have the ability to, to resist deception. You have the ability to resist Satan. So if the child is a Christian, you can tell them that. And you can say, um, okay, so Satan is he doesn't he doesn't try to do things that look bad. 
he wants you to do things that are bad, but he, he makes them look good. That's how he gets you to do them. He makes them look good. He makes them look fun, you know, um, it, or he makes them look harmless. So that's, that's what you have to be aware of. So you need to check it out. So somebody's doing casting spells to do something good in a movie. Yeah, that looks good. It's like, well, he's helping people. He did something good. He cast a spell and he did this great thing. You know, he made the forest, the forest was dying and he made the forest come to life. And now, it, you know, all the flowers are growing and everything's great. Yeah, that looks great. But he's using power that's not from God. Therefore, there is eventually there's going to be a bad ending to this. Yeah. And so um, I think it's real important to talk to them about how things that look good can actually be evil. So that is that is, I think, an important point that they that a lot of children don't understand, um, especially, you know, the of course, the younger they are. But I think you can also present it in a way that it's not like. They have to be afraid of everything because it might be from Satan. You know, you know, you don't want them to think that. But, um, you know, you just want them to be careful in these areas. The supernatural is where Satan really likes to. That's like his playground because he can be so deceptive with it. And because it's so intriguing to so many people, including adults. Do you know that when um, the Harry Potter books were coming out, you know, one after another, and they would have these huge, you know, um, uh, the bookstores would be open and people yeah. stand, in line all, uh, stand in line all night, you know, to get the, the latest book and everything. I had so many emails during that time. I actually had a grandmother who emailed me and said she got interested in Harry Potter. I think when her grandchildren were reading them and she actually got so interested in the occult, she bought some tarot cards. Oh, no. And she said, yeah, she said, I got so intrigued by this. Um, I mean, tarot cards are not in the Harry Potter books, but a lot of occult practices are. I do have articles on the Harry Potter books just for those who want to and, know. And you and I did a video on that topic, too, that I'll link in the description below. Oh, OK. OK. Yeah. 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 And um, and she said, I can't believe that I did this. But she said there was something about it that was so intriguing to me. Yeah. And she was a Christian. She she said, I'm a Christian. And she said, then she realized it. I mean, then the Lord convicted her of it and she realized how long it was. But she got hooked into it for a short time. And she said she realized the power that this had, that this had to pull you in. Yeah. And that's another thing I want to mention is that now for some people, that's not true. They have no interest in it or they find it completely repulsive. They're not interested. They don't care. But for a lot of people, it has this power to pull you in mm -hmm. and it's very hard to resist. And you can rationalize it in your mind and think, well, I'm just going to check it out and see what it's like. You know, I'm not really going to do anything. I'm just going to see what it's like, you know, or I'm just going to do it for a short while. You know, you, you can, there are all kinds of things you can say to yourself to make it seem okay. Um, and so you can imagine if you as an adult can think that way, you can imagine for children Right. Who are much less mature in their thinking and, and they're just more immature. They're younger. How much harder it is for them to resist things. They just get caught up in it. And I've talked to a lot of teenagers who have gotten caught up in the occult. A lot of them. They, a lot of them through movies. Uh, when the movie, The Craft, it was a huge kind of underground hit. And I had several teenage girls tell me that they got into a Wicca through watching that movie. Um, and they did actually, that movie did actually have an actual witch who was a, a consultant on the movie. Wow. And I saw it. I saw the movie as a Christian. I rented it. Um, I knew a lot of teenagers were watching it. So I watched it and I could see uh, how the movie was doing stuff that, that was actually based on occult principles and how it was teaching that, there's such a thing as white magic and black magic. And that's what's got a lot of teenagers into Wicca because they thought, well, white magic is good. And, you know, black magic, I won't do the black magic. I'll just do white magic. And that's what lured a lot of teenagers in was that idea. So, um, you know, that was just one movie. And then, of course, there was so much more. That was like 94, 95 or something. 
And after that, and after Harry Potter, it just exploded in the culture. I mean, Harry Potter opened the door to a lot more books like that, a lot more movies. Um, Now it's almost common to find this kind of literature or these kind of movies or cartoons, you know, for really young children. Yeah. We'll have some of these elements. And at this point, before I forget, (laughs) before I forget, I want to make an important point about fantasy versus the occult. And I do have a chapter, a whole chapter on that in the book, because I am not saying that fantasy is bad. Okay. Using the imagination is not bad. All right. We have, most of us have some creative imagination, some people more than others, you know, some people are artists, they're musicians, they're, they're sculptors, you know, they have a very creative imagination. Um, and God, that's something, you know, God gives us. It reflects God is the creator. And he also gives us an ability to be creative up to a certain extent. And fantasy can be very healthy. There is healthy fantasy. So um, what I have in the book is learn to tell the difference between fantasy and the occult. Now, the problem is, is that a lot of books and movies mix the two together. They do. Yep. I was going to say they glorify sorcery and yeah. they, have, they have spell casting in them. Uh, yeah. And right. so what, what about the people who are pushed back and say, well, we're just being pharisaical and legalistic. Yeah. Um, and because <laughs> it's just entertainment, Marsha, this is just having fun. What about, what do you say? And I, I get that pushback too. So what yeah. do you say when yeah. they, they want to just argue that it's, it's just a movie. It's just a book. Just It's just out. a movie. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I've been told that. I wish I had a dollar for every time. Right? I, yeah. Yeah. I could, I could take you and me out to a really, really fancy let's, restaurant. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> um, and probably to three or four restaurants. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so this is my answer to that because I've also gotten, well, it's just fiction, it's just a book. So here's my answer to that. Books and movies have messages in them. Just because they're fiction doesn't mean that there isn't a message. And it doesn't mean that the child or the, the teenager is not going to emotionally connect to the message. Um, you know, it, it. yeah, sure, it's just a fiction, it's just a movie. But it still has idea, or it can have ideas in it. I mean, not all movies, but the kind of movies and books we're talking about. They have ideas in them. And those ideas are carried through in the movie. And even though the person watching it may not realize it, they're being taught something without understanding, especially a younger, you know, a child doesn't realize it. So they're being taught, okay, there is such a thing as white magic. You can use magic for good. I mean, that's a big example that, that you find in a lot of these things. You can use sorcery for good. Um, it's okay to, um, you know, talk to the dead. Um, there was a, um, well, there's been two, um, actually, there's been three movies with this in the title, which makes it very confusing to talk about. Uh, there's a James Cameron movie, Avatar, which has to do with, really with uh, new age stuff. It's very new age, but also some pagan stuff about the, um, the, the tree, uh, the big tree where they have in that movie is the goddess and all that. But that was more, um, even though I think a lot of children saw it, that was a little bit different category than what I'm talking about. Then there was Avatar, uh, a, which was a TV series, and then they made a movie out of it. And this particular TV series, and I watched several episodes of it. I went to, at the time, Blockbusters, when it existed, (laughs) and I rented several episodes of Avatar and watched them because the reason this happened is because a, a, a woman told me that she let her son watch Avatar. And she said one day he said something to her about wisdom He said something about how the avatar was getting wisdom from um, these spirit beings or something. And she she thought that was odd. So I thought, okay, I need to check this out. Avatar was a mixture of Eastern religious ideas like reincarnation and a lot of occultism, a lot of sorcery and communication with the dead. It had all three. It had all three in there. Um, it, I mean, I couldn't, I was actually blown away by all the occultism in, in that series. 
and what I saw in the episodes. And then I went online and on the website, there was even more. Um, and this boy, of course, was supposedly a reincarnation and he could master the four elements. There were four tribes. Wow. Each tribe was aligned with a particular element, air, earth, water, fire. And there was uh, one of the elements had was making war on the others or something like that. And so he was born at this particular time because he had mastery over all four elements and he could bring all of the four tribes together, something like mm. that. Wow. So there was a lot, a lot of sorcery in it. And this whole thing with the, uh, he would take trips and go to the realm of the dead. I was reading this stuff and realizing all these children were watching this program. And, and these are younger children watching it. These are probably not so much teenagers as kids, you know, five, six, seven, eight, mm -hmm. nine watching this stuff. I mean, maybe some younger teenagers, but it was geared towards younger children. Mm -hmm. Um and then they made a movie, a couple of movies based on it. But I was appalled by the occultism that I yeah. found. And the, and the reincarnation idea was very big. Yeah. And of course, in case, in case people don't know, the word avatar is a word from Hinduism that technically means it's the incarnations of the god Vishnu. So supposedly Vishnu incarnates every so often. And I think every several thousand years or something as a, and he often incarnates as an animal. So sometimes he's an animal and eventually he's going to have one final incarnation. And so this is a, a, a Hindu belief system that the word avatar is coming from because um, Vishnu can incarnate at will in any form that he, he desires. And he comes at a time when um, humanity needs needs rescue so yeah, yeah. The, the false savior <laughs> yeah yeah exactly the false savior so i don't want people to think fantasy is bad but be careful if it's being mixed in with the occult. It, it does there's there's definitely an evangelical um motive behind i think every movie including christian movies christian movies hope that you will turn to jesus and so why wouldn't the movies that come from secular worldly occultic backgrounds hope that you follow their path everyone's pushing their agenda and so let's yeah. talk well let, marcia let's talk about disney because oh. you know, i i was born in 1958 and i was watching disney movies in the 60s and the first movie i remember from disney was called thomasina the cat it was an old black and white movie from disney that was about a cat that died and went and saw the egyptian cat goddess and then she, this cat reincarnated, and mm. it was it was all about life after death. As and this was me being a tiny little kid who loved kittens and cats, <laughs> and I know that influenced me. And and Disney has not gotten any better. I mean, Disney from the inception has taken, like you said, blended fantasy with a cult. We've got the Fantasia sorcerer, we've got the all the witches, and and then uh, you know making some of the evil characters sympathetic. Yes, so, yeah. so so should a parent allow their children to watch Disney or to be involved, or is it with supervision and and conversation would this be okay? I think it depends on the age of the child um, and their spiritual maturity. Um, I think, again, I think up to a certain age. Um, I just my own. I'm not a parenting expert, so I I, I want. You know, I want to put that out there. I'm not trying to say I'm an expert in, in being a parent, but I think it's okay um, up to a certain age to just forbid it okay. and not, and not, no, you cannot see this. After that age, you know what, because I got this question a lot from parents who had teenagers who wanted to read Harry Potter. And I said the best thing to do, and I, and I know that this is asking a lot, is to read the Harry Potter books while your child's reading them so that you know what's in them and you can talk to them about it. Because if you aren't reading them, you don't know what's in them. How can you talk to them about it? You know, at least read some of the books. Um, and I know that takes time, but how can you talk to your child? Sometimes, um, you know, you can tell your child, I don't think you should read this, but if they're like 15, 16, I don't, you know, I'm not sure how are you going to, 
you know, keep them from reading. And I mean, you don't buy it for them. They can always buy it themselves. They can read it, you know, when you're not around or somewhere else or, you know, um, I think so. That's why you need to know what's in it so you can talk to them. I'm more for let's talk about this with old, with older children, like especially 13 and up. Um, now, unless it's a really extremely um, a real extreme movie that really has. I don't know. I, I'm trying to think of something that's maybe would be really objectionable, maybe because of the violence or something like that. Something really, really horrific. Um, but popular kind of things that people are seeing. Um, yeah, it's, you know, I, I don't, I don't want, I don't think I can give one answer for everybody. I think yeah. that a lot depends on the child, how the parent wants to deal with that subject with their child. Do they want to maybe watch the movie with their child? Now I've had Christian parents tell me that that's what they do with their older children they say, okay, let's watch it together. If you want to watch it, let's watch it together. And then we'll talk about it. And I think that's fine. If that's the approach they want, because it can be a teaching tool where you can explain it. You can explain what the problem is. Just, do you remember the scene in the movie where so-and-so did that? Let's talk about that. What was that about? And then you can actually help them develop discernment on these things. Yeah. But younger children, that's harder to do. You know, if they're like, you know, seven, eight or nine, that's, that's very hard. But I think with older children, you can, you can do that and explain to them and help them develop discernment using God's word to show why it's wrong. So I'm, I'm more in the camp of with the older children where you watch it with them if you can or talk to them about it. So you either you watch it your, on your own, they've already seen it, and it's something that you know has occult things in it, then somehow watch it on your own, um, and then talk to them about it. Yeah. Say, you know, I saw I saw the movie, so I but I would like to talk to you about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that also helps them, you know, it helps them see for themselves because ultimately they're going to have to you know, they're going to be deciding these things for themselves. You can't, you're not going to be there to tell them <laughs> that's not a good idea to watch that or to read that book. Uh, so you want them to develop the discernment before yeah. they're on their own. Um, but even small children, that's why I say you can explain, like I, I like I was gave the example of the Garden of Eden and the yin yang symbol. Well, why is the yin yang symbol? Why is that not a Christian idea? What's wrong with that? Um, and you can just think of things from the Bible that will show why it's wrong. And then you can explain to the child. Uh, so, you know, it would depend yeah. a lot on that. I probably specifically, I used to get asked a lot about Harry Potter. My answer was if they're 13 or above um, and they really want to read it, then my, my answer to that is you read it too and talk to them about it. Yeah. So you want to equip, equip your child. Right. Yeah. You want to equip them. Yeah. Um, and not, and also not be, um, you don't want to create, um, undue fear, you know, like, oh, no, 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 you can't, you can't see that. You can't read that. Like, this is going to be horrible. It's yeah. going to really harm you. You know, you don't want to create in a younger or older child. You don't want to react as though you are afraid. Uh, because really, you know, God, there's no place in the Bible where God tells us to fear Satan. Um, he tells us to be vigilant. He tells us to be discerning. He tells us to trust him. He tells us to submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Mm -hmm. Well, the first part of that is submit to God because you can't resist the devil if you don't submit to God first. So mm -hmm. submit to God, resist the devil is actually, um, I don't know if it's one sentence in the Greek, but it's not in the English. It's not two sentences. It's together. Submit to God, comma, resist the devil, and he will flee. So, um, and actually at the end of the book, I talk about God's character and how important it is to see who God is. And I always go back to that, not just for discerning the occult, but for a lot of things. I always go back to God's character because false teachings and false ideas always go against God's character or they depict God in a way that is not who he is. So there's always a way where you can test something by knowing God's character. Amen. 
Marsha, you've talked a lot about discernment and equipping the children and the parents for the blatant occultism and new age practices and teachings that are in the culture. What about some of the more subtle, almost new thought teachings that you find in Disney and other um, kids programs that teach kids to follow your heart and follow your dreams, wish upon a star. What about that? How does that affect kids? And what would you say to parents? Um, yeah, that's almost kind of a secular kind of thinking that's very common in our culture. <laughs> um, you know, wish upon a star, you can be anything you want. Um, if you dream it, you know, you can make it come true. Um, I, I think that falls under the category of, of, um, gosh, that would, that would fall into the category of not of being realistic. I mean, I don't know what else to say. It's, it, you, we need to be realistic about things. Um, and just thinking something to make it true is actually used in sorcery. So it's actually part of sorcery. If the idea that if you believe something can happen, if I really believe that this will happen, if I really think about it uh, and, and see it as coming true, then I'll make it happen. That is new thought. But that is really based on a principle of sorcery because that's used in sorcery. That The whole idea of sorcery is that something already exists in another reality or realm. And that if you use the right tools or say the right words or use the right thinking, you can manifest it into reality. You make it come into reality. That's actually sorcery. So you could use that as part of the teaching of sorcery. It's not just casting spells or doing some kind of magic, supernatural magic. But it's also the idea that your thoughts can make things real just by thinking them, just by thinking them. Because that's actually used in, um, apparently it's used a lot in sports. Um, I had... Um, a parent, actually a couple of parents, and this had to be at least 10 years ago. Um, one of them, their child, uh, who, I think she was 15 or 16, was on the swim team. And the coach was using this kind of thinking, telling them, if you visualize yourself, this was visualization, you visualize yourself, you know, doing this in the water and keep thinking that. And he was urging them to picture it, to actually sit down and spend time visualizing it in your head because he told them, if you do that enough, you'll actually achieve it. So yeah, they were having to practice, of course, but he was implanting this idea that they could make things come true with their mind. And so the parent contacted me because um, he was very concerned about this and wanted to know how, you know, what can I say to this coach? I don't, I don't want him teaching my daughter this kind of thing because it's not, you know, it's not biblical. So um, they may run into that even in school, like on a sports team or something like that, where they're being told to visualize certain things to make them come true, create a visualization. But I do have some material on my website yeah. on it, um, ChristianAnswersNewAge.com. Um, but that is a form of sorcery. And a lot of people don't know that. No, so don't. you can even find it in that kind of thing. And it seems so innocent. You know, that's the thing. It just seems so innocent, you know, just to think about something and then it'll become true. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't seem like an evil thing. Yeah. And then they want to twist scripture to try to justify it, too. Exactly. Yes. And then, yes, absolutely. Um, New Thought will use scripture that, you know, Ben, they'll, and they'll quote Jesus, you oh, know, sure. whatever you ask in my father's name, you'll, he will give you. And that's, of course, taking it out of context and not comparing it to other scriptures. Right. Because, you know, the Bible says to desire things that God wants for you, to desire what God wants and, and to want his will above all. So, you know, it doesn't mean just if I really want this, then I'll just ask for it and God will give it to me. But yeah, it's completely, scripture's completely misused for that. Absolutely. Don't think that this doesn't apply to, you know, to your child or to where you are living today. You know, you might be living somewhere where you don't see a lot of this stuff or you, 
the families you know aren't interested in the occult and your child's in a Christian school. But that doesn't matter because it is just everywhere in the culture. It's just all over the place. And the entertainment world, oh, as we said, you know, the movies and books and everything are full of it. It's sad, it, much more so than when I first wrote the book. Much more so. So you can't think that it is not applicable to today. It definitely right. is. And the main thing I want to do with the book is, you know, I can't do, sometimes people would used to ask me, well, what's a list of video games that I should not get for my child? <laughs> or what's a list of books I should not buy my child? Well, you know, you could spend a whole year without sleeping or eating and trying to come up with a list. And then after you did that list, then more books would come out the That's next right. year. So basically it would be a full-time 24 seven job. So what I want to do is for parents to recognize the principles of the occult. What are the principles uh, as given in scripture? And then they can recognize them for themselves. So I tell parents, one of the main things to look for is when a movie or book makes something evil look good. That's the main thing. It's not that it has evil in it because let's say, it's a story about um, somebody who uh, a, 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 somebody who's casting spells and then somehow uh, the hero outwits this person and um, gets them to expose themselves and they have to give up their magic or whatever happens to them so they don't get to, they don't have to do it they can't do their magic anymore but he just does it by outwitting them okay. The fact that there's somebody in there doing spells doesn't mean that that's a bad story. It's how the person is depicted. So, you know, if the witch is bad in the story, you know, and there's no white magic, it's not bad. It's not it's not like you can't have anything that books that have a, a villain in them or an evil person or something. Just it's when it makes something bad look good. That's what I always tell them. That's what you have to look for. So that's the main, that's one of the main things to remember. Um, so that, and I think that the book divides things up. I have a whole chapter on the Ouija board, which actually began as, um, it was actually a tool invented by a spiritualist in France, a man who communicated with the dead. Uh, and he was coming up with a way that would make it easier or he, you know, he thought it would be. And that developed later into the Ouija board in the 20th century. Uh, so um, I have chapters on all these different areas. I try to explain the occult and I have chapters. And then I have chapters on how you answer objections. So what what do you say to your child when he or she says this? You know, like, oh, it's just it's just a game. It's just a movie or all my friends are doing it. You know, so mm-hmm. I have um, I have objections that you probably will hear from your child and I give suggestions on how to answer those so that's in the book as well so it's try you know it's trying I'm trying to be very comprehensive and cover the whole area the book was actually first published by Cook and they asked me to write this book I did not come up with the idea at all and they said they wanted a guide for parents or other adults on how to deal with the occult in their culture that is targeting children and and teenagers. And so that was their idea. You know, I didn't even come up with the idea, but I think that it does address a lot of issues in our culture that are still current. So hopefully, you know, it will be helpful. And I'm always willing to answer questions. So I'm on Facebook. Uh, My ministry page is Christian Answers for the New Age. And my website, and you can email me from the website. So if you're reading and you have questions, please, you know, just ask them. (laughs) I will I will be happy to try to answer or help you in any way that I can. Well, Marsha, we want to thank you so much for your devotion to exposing darkness as we are commanded to do in Ephesians 511. And you do such meticulous research. You back everything up with studies, with scripture. And this book is no exception, Spellbound. This is a guidebook that will equip adults who are working with kids, whether it's your own kids, whether you're a teacher or a Sunday school teacher or you're a caring grandparent or aunt. Um, yeah. I, rec- I highly recommend this book, Spell- 
bound. And the link to buy this book is in the description below. And also Marsha's contact details, as well as her website, Christian Answers for the New Age, which has a search engine where you can find her voluminous number of blogs and articles that she's got on virtually any topic you can think of. It's such a great resource that you've offered us. Thank you so much, Marcia. Thank you for, for having me talk about this book. I really appreciate it.